This tutorial series is for IC2 Experimental, which is the current IC2 version, being used on FTB Monster. This is part two of the Industrial Craft 2 Experimental version tutorial series. Alright guys, so now that we've covered most of the basics, let's start talking a little bit more of some advanced EU generation. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about is the semi-fluid generator is this bad boy right here. Now, it produces anywhere between 8 and 32 EU per tick, and it depends on what fluids um, you use. So, it takes various fluids, obviously, and it will produce EU at different rates based on the fluid selection. Now, it can store 10 buckets, or 10,000 millibuckets, of fluid. Um, and buckets and s cells that you put in here will not be used up. So buckets, both buckets and cells will not be used up. Now, fluids in EU production is biofuel, produces 16 EU per tick, and 32,000 per bucket. Biomass is only 8 EU per tick and 8,000 per bucket. Ethanol is 16, to 16 EU per tick and 32,000 per bucket. Fuel is 32 EU per tick and 128,000 per bucket. And oil is 8 EU per tick and 16,000 per bucket. Now, you'll have to have other mods installed like Buildcraft to get, say, ethanol or fuel and oil. And forestry for ethanol and biomass. Now, um, this semi fluid generator has an internal capacity of 32,000 EU. And it is made with four iron item casings, a geothermal generator, which we'll talk about in a second, and universal fluid cells, empty universal fluid cells. Now those are made with four tin item casings and a glass pane. You can see all the different types of fuel you can use here. We'll go ahead, you know what, we'll use fuel from Buildcraft. And we can just put that in the input slot. This will give you your bucket back and it will produce EU and put it into this bat box. Alright, now there's a solar panel. Solar panels are really good passive energy generation. Um, they produce only one EU a tick and it only works during day and if it's exposed to the sky. Now, the weather affects the EU rates so rain and thunder lowers the EU amount it um, produces. It is made with a generator, two electronic circuits, three coal dust, um, and three glass. Now you can make a bunch of these, put them in like a solar flower, and you can generate quite a bit of EU. And you can see it's already filled this bat box in the time that it took me to make all the rest of this tutorial. Um, but the next item is the geothermal generator, which produces 20 EU per tick. And we talked about that a little bit over there in the example. Um, it uses lava, um, lava, lava buckets or cells, or piped in directly with fluid pipes. Um, it can hold 8 buckets internally, or 8,000 millibuckets, internal storage of 24,000 EU, and it has 10,000 total EU per bucket of lava put into the geothermal generator. Now it basically has the same interface as the semi-fluid generator. Uh, buckets can be put in here and output there. And it generates EU and it will put it into this bat box. Now it's made with a generator, two iron item casings, four glass, and two empty cells. Alright guys, so now we talked about some advanced power generation, let's talk about some advanced machines to use that power. Now, we're going to show, I'm going to show you a setup of a really, the highest possible yield for ore processing. Now, first thing you're going to need to know is how to make an advanced machine casing, which is just a basic machine casing with two of those carbon plates and two advanced alloys. You can see I have an MFSU which is powering these machines right here. First is the macerator. 
Um, also showing you the recipe for the electric motor because you'll need that for these recipes. First is just the macerator, which is fine because we'll need one of those. You can see I put some various upgrades, some overclockers, energy storage upgrades, and transformer upgrades, as well as an ejector upgrade to automatically output to the right. Now this is a ore washing plant. Basically, it has a minimum power of 16 EU per tick, maximum power of 32 EU a packet, and it won't explode. Has an internal energy storage of 16,000 EU. Uh, it takes 8,000 EU per operation, and the minimum power will run the ore washing plant continuously. Now that is created by two of those motors, electronic circuit, basic machine casing, two buckets, and three iron plates. Alright, so here's the interface for that little bit crazy. It does require water, which means you can either pipe it in directly with some form of fluid pipes like Buildcraft, or you can use water cells um, to put in this slot here, and those will automatically output uh, water and give you the cell back. Now you have some upgrades here as well, the same ones as in the macerator, and this is its progress bar right here. Now, the next machine is the thermal centrifuge, which has a minimum power of 48 EU per tick, maximum power of 128 EU per packet, it will not explode in IC2 experimental, it's 40, 48,000 EU internal energy storage, uh, it takes 15,000, around 15,000 EU per operation, and the minimum power will run it continuously, and it will also take a small amount of EU when powered up. Now what it means by that is you can see this heat level right here. It's fluctuating between 5,000 and 4,999. Now the way to keep this thermal centrifuge heat heated up, which is required to have max heat to begin uh, processing stuff, you just need to apply a redstone signal. So you can see I have this lever that is keeping this heated up and it will require a small amount of EU as long as it is powered on. Um, so the thermal centrifuge is created by four iron ingots, one of those electronic motors, an advanced machine casing, two coils, and a mining laser. Now we'll talk about this tool in a little bit later. However, it is just made with advanced alloys, advanced circuit, an energy crystal, and two redstone. Alright, so now let's talk about how this whole setup works. Um, so basically, you're going to put your... Let's quickly grab some iron ore in the macerator as usual. You can see that's going to quickly get broken down into those crushed ores. That's going to create two. Now that's going to automatically output to the ore washing plant. And that is going to uh, clean the ores, the crushed iron ores. And you'll see you get some extra stuff here. And it's going to make purified crushed ore. When put into thermal centrifuge, that will make an iron dust and a tiny pile of gold dust. So you're getting stone dust, tiny piles of iron dust, which can be used to make, um, nine of them can be used to make another iron dust, which can be smelted into an ingot, as well as you're going to get extra stuff from this, extra gold dust, so you'll also be able to turn that into gold. Now each um, type of metal can create an extra, a different type of extra tiny pile, but you're always going to get some stone dust and um, extra tiny piles of the ore that you're smelting. So you can see you're just going to start getting a lot more out of that. So you're going to get extra of another type of metal as well as nearly tripling the amount of you basically are tripling the amount of stuff you're getting from your ores, nearly. Because if you count the extra um, gold ingot that you're getting from iron, you're basically tripling your ores, which is really nice. Now, these machines are also used in some other uh, things to process stuff for nuclear reactors, which nuclear reactors are the thing we're going to talk about next. Okay, so one other machine I want to talk about before we go into the nuclear uh, reactor stuff. That is the induction furnace. Now, the induction furnace smelts 
two items at once and is considerably faster than the electric furnace. Now it needs to charge up and needs one of you a tick to stay charged while idle. So it's basically, it needs a lever, a redstone signal, anything like that for um, it to stay charged, just like the thermal centrifuge. Now it takes 16 EU a tick for minimum power. The maximum is 128 EU a packet. It will not explode in experimental version. Uh, its internal energy storage is 10,000 and it takes uh, 6,000 EU for a 0% operation. So you can see we're at 100%. And 100% for uh, it takes 208 EU per operation. So, really big decrease there. And also, it increases at 100%, it increases the speed by a ton. Now, 16 EU a tick will run the uh, induction furnace continuously. So, if we look at it here, it has two slots right here. Um, every machine has this bottom slot here that you can put batteries in to charge up. Forgot to note that about the ba basic machines. Um, but as you can see, it smelts two items at once extremely fast. Now, the thing to note about the induction furnace, it has no upgrade slots. So you can't use an ejector upgrade or anything like that, which is kind of a bummer. Um, however, it smelts things so fast, you don't really need it to automate anything. You can just sit here for like 10 seconds and have a whole stack of these dust smelted at 100%. Now, it's made with seven copper ingots, an advanced machine casing, and an electronic or electric furnace. And as you can see, it's just an insane way to smelt stuff. Okay, so now we're going to get into nuclear reactors. And nuclear reactors are can be pretty complicated until you get the hang of it. So, the first thing you're going to need is this suit here. This is a hazmat suit, which requires you to make a scuba helmet, which is some rubber, some iron bars, a glass, and an orange dye. Um, a hazmat suit, which is six rubber and two orange dye. Hazmat suit leggings, six rubber and one orange dye. And rubber boots, which is six rubber and wool. Rubber boots also, I believe, negate fall damage to a certain extent and take durability depending on how far you fall, which is pretty nice. Now, I'm going to quickly put that on. And as you can see, I'm wearing that, wearing that suit there. However, the reason you need this is because when you handle the fuel source for nuclear reactors, it will give you a um, effect kind of like pose poison I guess would be closest to and it's called radiation so you have to wear a full hazmat suit to not get radiation poisoning um, so let's quickly talk about what you need for a nuclear reactor um, you can use these reactor chambers um, you're gonna need three of them anyway to make the nuclear reactor which takes four lead plates and a basic machine casing and the nuclear reactor takes three of those and a generator four dense lead plates, which dense plates are just made by compressing nine plates. Um, and then an advanced circuit. Uh, so the nuclear reactor itself can produce one anywhere between one and 8,196 EU per tick. There's almost an unlimited amount of ways to set up a nuclear reactor. Um, various setups produce various amounts of energy units per tick. So, we'll quickly grab two things, just to show you a quick nuclear reactor. Now, that is a nuclear reactor um, set up inside here. You can see it's a nuclear reactor by itself has three slots. These ones you can't put anything in. Um, and then, you can unlock these slots by placing the re additional reactor chambers around the nuclear reactor for a total of five extra lines here. Now, this is the fuel, it's uranium, and this is a component, we'll talk about those a little bit later. Now the nuclear reactor requires a redstone signal to turn on, and you can see there it is, and it's using uranium slowly to produce 5 EU per tick in this default version. Now I'm pretty sure this, uh, this version will, won't ever explode, however, nuclear reactors that are created RON will explode, and they can explode a very big, they can create a very big explosion. Um, so, uranium, which is the ore that we got, that we talked about a little bit earlier, 
um, fuels the reactor with each pulse. Now, each pulse produces 100 EU in 20 ticks, or 5 EU a tick. Now, a pulse happens every second. Each cell lasts for 10,000 pulses. Placing cells next to another creates an extra pulse. So basically, if you have two cells placed next to each other, so if I had two of these fuel or rods, I guess, if you had two of these rods placed next to each other, then um, right now it's just pu pulsing once, creating five EU per tick. If you have another rod here, they will each pulse twice every second, which would then create um, 10 EU per tick. Or actually, 20 EU per tick, sorry. It would create 20 EU per tick, and we can actually see that just by getting another one of those fuel rods here. Put this in there. Turn that on. You can also see it has a heat thing. Now it's producing 20 EU per tick because each of these fuel rods are pulsing twice. You can see it's building up heat, and once that heat reaches a certain point, it will, in fact, explode. All right. Um, while separate, if I put these not next to each other, they will just still individually produce one pulse. Um, a reactor, an overheating reactor will cause it to explode. A reactor with heat will also, at a certain point, the reactor heats up to a certain point, and at that point, it will start fires around it, hurt living things, and melt stone into lava. Um, you can also make dual cells and quad cells. So dual cell takes two fuel cells um, or fuel rods and puts it into an iron plate or uh, and an iron plate to make dual. Now the quad fuel rod takes four of those and two copper plates and three iron plates. Um, so dual cell max pulses can be six. The quad cells max pulses are seven and it would create a ton of heat and the reactor can withstand 10,000 heat before exploding. Cells heat all surrounding components and that heat vent that you saw in there was a component that accept it. And accept is spelled wrong. It will only heat the hole itself if there's no suitable component next to the cell. Alright? So, um, let's quickly talk about uh, reactor setup that I've made here. Now this is a reactor that is never going to blow up and it's really efficient. Okay? So you can see there's a lot of stuff going on here. Now, the easiest way to uh, make a good reactor is to just copy this, but we're going to talk about each one of the components individually in a little bit. You can see we have four quad fuel rods as well, and that's creating the power. Now if we turn this lever on, you can see we're creating 320 EU per tick, which is really nice. And it's not ever going to start heating up because of all the other things that we have around it. Alright. And you can see it outputs um, either through a cable or by an MF via MFSU placed directly next to one of the reactor chambers. You can also access the nuclear reactor um, by right-clicking any of the reactor chambers surrounding it. Um, so when that is done, you'll also get these depleted uranium fuel cells or fuel rods as well. And we'll talk about what to do with those in a second. Now you notice I have this room made of reinforced stone. Okay? So that little door thing is from uh, Extra Utilities, I do believe, to make that work. Um, but reinforced stone doesn't really have a recipe that you can look up in NEI. It's kind of special. So let's talk about really quickly how to make that. Um, what you're going to need is CF powder, which is made from stone dust that you got from your um, ore washing plant, some clay, and some sand. You're also going to need a CF sprayer, just some iron item casings and a universal fluid cell, and some iron scaffolding, which is made from iron plates and iron fences, which are just iron item casings in an extruding uh, set, mode set, metal former. Alright, so let's quickly grab all that stuff. Now, you're going to need to do this in a canning machine. And the canning machine is going to need water in the left tank. So, you're going to need to do that pump setup I was talking about. So, you can see I have an infinite water source here. 
and I have a pump. Now the pump is set to eject fluids. Now you can see it looks like it's pointing um, to where it's going to eject it out the back. However, remember it is set to um, north side. So it's going to set um, eject it this way to the cannon machine. Um, so let's quickly change it to daytime again. The pump is made by empty cells. An electronic circuit, basic machine casing, two mining pipes, which are made from some iron plates and a tree tap. A tree tap and a basic machine casing. I think I already said that, but that's okay. Um, you're going to need 4 EU a tick for minimum power, 32 EU a packet for maximum. It will not explode as all the other machines. Um, its internal energy storage is 40 EU, and it takes 20 EU per operation. And the minimum power will run it continuously. has an internal fluid storage of 8 buckets. So you can see, I've used to use the generator to pump out water, which is, has to be one block directly below the pump, and it's ejected into this candy machine. Now you're going to want to use fluid in rich mode, and you put your CF, CF sprayer right here. You're going to want to fill it with CF powder. And you can see the candy machine will then output the CF sprayer, or I guess it's going to keep going until it's full. However, we'll just take it out for right now. That is a little bit strange. It looks like it's going to go ahead and complete, even though there's nothing there. Oh, I see it's going to put it in this tank here. We'll go ahead and stop that. All right, so now with the CF sprayer, you're going to want to put um, iron scaffolding and, um, oops, you're going to want to put iron scaffolding reinforced construction foam on that iron uh, scaffolding. Then you're going to wait a second. If I remember correctly, I'm trying to make sure that my memory does not fail me here. That it should just take a certain amount of time. I could have done that backwards, so I'm not entirely sure. Whoops, that was not what I meant to do. Okay, yeah. I think I got it. Um, actually, you just put sand into the iron scaffolding, so you do that, put the, oh, I guess I'm out here, um, but you put the CF sprayer in there, and I forgot, you don't need to wait for it, you just gotta put sand in it, and that will create reinforced stone, which does take a while to mine, so, uh, might be a good idea to place the iron scaffoldings first, and then where you want them, instead of making a bunch of those blocks, and then trying to mine them all. Okay, so the next thing to talk about, let's quickly put this away is how to get these fuel rods. So we're going to take some uranium ore, and we're going to bring it over to the uh, macerator, ore washing plant setup. And you can see it's going to macerate the uranium ore. And it's going to turn it into this crushed uranium ore. And when you ore wash plant that, it is going to turn it into, it's going to give you some tiny pile of lead dust, and some stone dust, as always. And it's going to turn into purified crushed uranium ore. And when you are done with that, it is going to make uranium and tiny pile of uranium. Now, tiny pile of, of uranium is used in a recipe to make enriched uranium nuclear fuel. So you take three, six uranium, three tiny piles of uranium, and you get one enriched uranium nuclear fuel. Okay? So then with that... You're going to take fuel rod empty, which is um, just iron plates in an extruding mode metal former. And you're going to take that to a canning machine. You're going to turn it to canning mode. And you're going to put the fuel rods in the left slot and the enriched uranium nuclear fuel in the middle slot. And that is going to fill the fuel rods with the fuel. And you can see we got that. So that is how to create the uranium fuel. Now I'm going to quickly take off a hazmat suit, because I'm in creative. And you can see I have that radiation effect for a full minute. Alright? Now that is really annoying. It actually damages the person. And I think it can actually kill you, unlike poison. So you want to be careful with that. Definitely only handle uranium. Um, in its uh, more enriched forms raw form you can kind of I think you can do you can get it you can hold the ore without having the problem but these forms you cannot handle it 
Okay, so now that we talked about a couple of that stuff with the um, uh, nuclear reactor here, we're going to quickly talk about what you can do with the depleted uranium. Okay? So you're going to get this. Uh, you have a certain percent chance to get it when these things are emptied. And these are used in a thermal centrifuge. So we'll go ahead and take all this out here. Okay, and we'll put these in the thermal thermal centrifuge here. Uh, the heat has gone down. It looks like for some reason. Not entirely sure why, um, but basically it's not going to work until it gets to four thousand heat, which we'll do in a second. And this is going to make uranium. It's going to turn it back into some, give you back some uranium. And tiny piles of plutonium is the main thing you're going to want. Okay. So each one of these quad ones gives you 16 uranium and four tiny piles of plutonium. Um, plutonium can be used. Let's quickly go back here. Um, plutonium. I'm trying to remember where I put it. All right, I'm gonna find it real quick. Okay, sorry about that. Um, tiny piles of plutonium can be used nine in a crafting station or crafting table to make one plutonium. Um, plutonium, three plutonium, and six uranium can make box nuclear fuel. Okay, and um, you can also use plutonium to make pellets of RTG fuel, which we'll talk about what that is used for in a second. All right, now box fuel is a little bit different than regular um, uranium. They have a life of five thousand seconds. Okay, so it's half of the life of a normal uranium fuel cell. Or fuel rod. Um, they have the same base EU output, heat output, and efficiency as uranium. However, the closer the reactor's heat is to 100%, the more EU it generates. So it can, at max, generate five times more EU at 100%, but 100% the reactor will explode. So you want a little bit less than that, around 4.6 thousand, or 4.6 times more EU can happen. However, that will make the area around you produce all those nasty effects, but it can get you a quick, large, very large amount of EU. Um, as you can see, you have all the basic same things as the uranium. You have the MOX nuclear fuel. You can put it into the fuel rod just the same, dual fuel rod just the same, and the quad fuel rod is the same. However, just using the fuel rods with MOX fuel. Alright. So let's quickly talk about what the RTG, pellets of RTG fuel can be used for. It can be used in a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, or an RTG, thus the name RTG fuel. Okay, so the RTG can produce 1 to 16 EU per tick. Its fuel source is the pellets of RTG fuel. Its maximum of, it has a maximum of 5 pellets that can be placed inside at once, as you can see. Um, they can't be stacked, so you'll have one for each slot. Um, each pellet increases the amount of EU produced per tick. RTG fuel will never expire, making the um, radioisotope thermoelectric generator the best infinite energy source. It will never explode or emit radiation in any way. So basically, you have once you get five, that's unlimited. It's never going to go away. It's not going to use the fuel. It's just going to generate 16 EU per tick at five maximum um, forever, basically. Now, energy production rates depend on how many pellets you have. You have one. It's just one EU. Um, two is two. Three is four. Four is eight. And five is 16. So basically, each pellet doubles the amount it had previously. And um, we'll grab five of these pellets and put them in the slots and you can see that is now producing EU at a considerable rate and that will do that forever. Now it's made by using a reactor chamber, generator, and some iron item casings. Now let's quickly go back to the nuclear reactor and talk about the various components. Alright, so the first component is coolant cells. Now you can remember the 10k coolant cell which was for the um, overclocker upgrade. Well, when coolant cells are placed next to a fuel cell, um, 
They have a max heat capacity, and when it is reached, they will melt, causing the fuel cell to begin heating the hole. So basically, a coolant cell, a 10K coolant cell, can hold 10,000 heat. And um, it is created like so, just like saw in the uh, overclockers. Now there's a 30K coolant cell, which is created with some tin plates around 10K coolant cells. And that can hold 30,000 heat before expiring. And you have the 60K, which can hold 60,000 heat before expiring. So those are a good way to, um, if you want a manual reactor where you have to keep replacing it, that's one way to do it. And the next thing to talk about is the um, exchangers. Now heat exchangers move heat around the reactor chamber. It will distribute heat to components capable of, of, of absorbing or dissipating it. It will attempt to balance the heat between adjacent components by percentage based on the heat capacity of those components. Okay, so this basically spreads around the heat, shares the love with every other component or the adjacent components in the reactor. Okay, so here's the regular heat exchanger. You have your reactor heat exchanger. You have your component heat exchanger. And you have your advanced heat exchanger. Okay. Now, the heat ex regular heat exchanger has a heat capacity of 2,500, or a whole, whole heat exchange rate of 4, um, and then a component heat exchange rate of 12. So that means it can exchange, um, the rates at which it exchanges heat is 12 to different components, and it can exchange 4 heat with the reactor every um, cycle. And then the reactor heat exchanger has a heat capacity of 5,000, and it can only exchange heat with the reactor. So it's not going to um, balance heat around adjacent components. It's going to put it into the actual reactor itself. Um, and it can do that at a rate of 70 heat, heat 72 heat per uh, cycle. Now, component heat extractor has a heat capacity of 10,000, and it cannot, um, it does not exchange heat between the whole of the reactor only exchanges heat with components and it does that at a rate of 36 heat per cycle. Now the advanced heat exchanger has a heat capacity of 10,000 and has it's basically an advanced version of the default heat exchanger. It can do um, both the whole and the components and it does the whole at a rate of 8 and the components at a rate of 24 per cycle. Now the next thing we'll talk about is the heat vents. Heat vents have a max heat capacity, self-cooling rate, and a reactor transfer rate. Okay, They will take heat from the whole or adjacent components and self-cools itself. They will not balance heat like exchangers, so they will take heat from reactor regardless of the heat level. That can be dangerous because it could cause them to completely destroy themselves. Now we have a bunch of different types here. We have the heat vent, the reactor heat vent, component heat vent, the overclocked heat vent, and the advanced heat vent. Okay, so the heat vent must be next to heat exchanger to absorb heat. So you're going to need a heat exchanger to absorb any heat with the heat vent because it does not um, transfer any heat itself. And it has a self-cool rate of 6 heat per cycle. Now the component heat vent absorbs heat from adjacent components. And it has a transfer rate of 4, and it self-cools at a rate of 4 heat per cycle as well. The reactor heat vent absorbs heat from the reactor hole. It has a transfer rate of 5 heat and self-cools at 5 heat. It can absorb, but not dissipate, heat from adjacent fuel cells. So it will absorb heat from fuel cells, adjacent fuel cells, but it will not dissipate it, so then it will eventually melt. Um, the advanced heat vent must be next to a heat exchanger as well, and or directly adjacent to a fuel cell to absorb heat. has a self-cooling rate of 12, basically in an upgraded version of the regular heat vent. Now the overclocked heat vent absorbs heat from reactor hole, and it transfers it at 36 heat per cycle and self-cools at 20. So an upgraded reactor heat vent will eventually destroy itself if not cooled by other heat vents like component heat vents. All right. So now we have the reactor plating. Reactor plating increases the maximum heat capacity of your reactor and also reduces the explosion range of the reactor when it reaches 100% capacity. 
This is useful for um, breeding, which isn't in Industrial Craft Experimental, so I won't be explaining that. Um, but it also is really useful for MOX fuel, increasing the heat capacity, um, I believe, increases the amount of... Well, I guess it doesn't really increase it. Oh, crap. Well, that was that. Anyway, this increases the um, heat capacity of your reactor. Now, I have different kinds. You have reactor platings. You have um, heat capacity reactor plating. And you have the containment reactor plating. Now, let me quickly fix this for the heat capacity reactor plating and stuff, and I'll be right back. Okay, guys, quickly fix that. Um, so the reactor plating itself has a max heat capacity increase of 1,000 and an explosion range reduction of 5%. The heat capacity reactor plating increases the max heat capacity by 1,700. However, its explosion range reduction is only 1%. And the containment reactor plating has a max heat capacity of only 500 increased and explosion range reduction is 10%, however. Now, you cannot negate an explosion effect completely with plating. So placing 10 containment reactor plating into a reactor is not going to mean you have a 100% reduction of explosion. It will still explode, and it will still do some damage. All right, so just two more components to talk about. That is condensators, which condensators will instantly eliminate heat from adjacent components. They will not break or overheat, but will stay in the reactor. They can be repaired and used again. So you have two different types. You have the RSH condensator, which takes a heat exchanger, heat vent, and some redstone. And you have the LZH condensator, which takes two RS RSH condensators, and a reactor heat vent, react um, reactor heat exchanger, and four redstone. Now, the RSH condensator um, has a max heat elimination of 20,000. So that means you you put it in there, it will instantly take out 20,000 heat of any adjacent components or the reactor hole itself. And it's also repaired with redstone dust, which means um, you can put in a crafting table redstone dust and an RS a used RSH condens condensator, and it will repair 10,000 um, points, heat points each. So two dusts for full repair. Now, the LZH condensator can eliminate 100,000 heat, um, and it's repaired with lapis or redstone. Um, redstone will repair at 5,000, and lapis for 40,000. So it takes three lapis for a full repair on the LZH condensator. Really useful stuff, e able to quickly take out a bunch of heat of your reactor. If it's nearly ex um, going to explode, you can just turn it off, take all the heat out, and turn it back on. So the next thing is neutron reflectors. It's a little bit more complicated. Neutron reflectors increase the energy efficiency of adjacent cells. So it basically works the same as placing a fuel cell next to another fuel cell. However, the neutron reflectors will not um, pulse any energy in themselves. Um, they have a limited life link before they are, they are destroyed, and the more fuel cells next to a reflector, the faster it expires. So basically, if you put four fuel cells next to a neutron reflector uh, or adjacent to the four adjacent sides of a neutron reflector it will make each of those fuel cells pulse twice however it will then um, expire four times faster so um, the neutron reflector here is made like so tin dust coal dust and copper plate and you also have a thick neutron reflector which is four neutron reflectors and some copper plates. Now the neutron reflector has a life length of 10,000 reactor ticks. Um, and two cells will destroy in five ticks. It's basically half fuel cell's life length. Um, one neutron reflector will last as long as one fuel cell. A thick neutron reflector has a life length of 40,000 reactor ticks. And two cells will destroy it in 20,000 ticks. So it can last for two times for two times the amount of a fuel cell's life length with just two cells surrounding it and I believe four cells will make it last as much as one uh, life length of a uh, fuel cell or fuel rod. Alright, so let's quickly, now with that knowledge, let's quickly check, take a look at the reactor again. Now you can see we have some quad fuel rods right here. We have some overclocked heat vents. Now as you know, these will destroy themselves if not cooled by something else. 
And these are going to be cooled with component heat vents. Okay? And a component heat exchanger is then also taking heat out of these overclocked heat vents and distributing it into these adjacent components up here. And this one is also taking it out of these ones and distributing it into all these, including some fuel cells. So you can see the only things we really use here are the fuel rods, overclocked heat vents, component heat vents, component heat exchangers, and 60k coolant cells. All right, and that is generating 320 EU per tick, and it will do that until these are completely gone and depleted. So I believe that's going to be the end of this part, guys. We got through some all the steps of nuclear fuel as well as advanced um, energy production and advanced uh, ore processing. On the next episode, we're going to start talking about some uh, way to make UU matter. And hopefully we'll have enough time to wrap um, or get close to wrapping up all the other various things that IC2 adds. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a like, it helps out a lot. And if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, to be notified when I upload more of these videos. Also, leave a comment telling me what mod spotlight I should do next, as I'm not really sure which ones you guys want to see, so just leave a comment telling me that. See you guys next time.